Hi, folks. <clears throat> well, thanks for letting me come and uh, share some of my thoughts and anxieties about street photography with you. And uh, <clears throat> there's a spoiler alert, which is um, I have a lot of questions and not many answers. <clears throat> and I have a lot of strong opinions, but unfortunately, I have a lot of other strong opinions that contradict the first set of strong opinions. <laughs> so I appreciate a chance to get to say this kind of stuff to you. Um, <clears throat> I've been fighting a sore throat all week, so bear with me. And if I should fall down on the carpet, unlikely. I think you should all rush up with your cameras and start taking pictures of me and saying something like, how do you like that street photography, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, I, I shoot a lot of different kinds of photography. I, I do the flowers and the sunsets and portraits of friends and landscape kind of stuff very casually. But to me, street photography is the heart of the whole enterprise. <clears throat> and I come out of the tradition of the street photographers of the 20th century. And I look back to, say, uh, Cartier-Bresson, Ajay and Brassai, and those people as my inspiration. I don't in any sense mean to say that I'm look, working at their level, but they're the guys that I look to for, uh, uh, for a model for what I'm trying to do. Um, do you know, do you have a good definition of, what you, of street photography? Or can I see a show of hands of people who think, yeah, I shoot street photography? Some. Anybody? Some, some do some, yeah. Uh, and feel comfortable with your definition of what that is and things. So I'm going to uh, start here. Let's see. Does that work? Yes. You know, here's a basic definition of it. And we could argue about every term in that definition. Uh, does the, uh, do they have to be candid? Um, there are a lot of people who would say, no, they don't have to be candid. You can walk up to somebody on the street and engage them and take their photo. That's part of the street photography. Um, for my part, I don't think that's true. That's not, that's not the way I understand it. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, it says in a public space, which it's not a, doesn't have to be a street. It could be anywhere where people can gather. And um, it usually involves a person, though you might think about Elliot Erwitt's pictures of dogs on the street and go, well, what about that? So uh, we can quibble about how we define this, but to me, this definition is what I'm working from, from doing that. Um, let's see what we got here. And what I'm gonna do is the basic <clears throat> thing is I'm gonna show, uh, a couple of dozen of my shots of street photographs and talk about them some, and uh, particularly in terms of any ethical issues that might arise when we look at that image and how I took it. Um, this will be a lot more fun if it's a discussion as much as it is a presentation, so I'm really relying on everybody here to uh, uh, chip in your own thoughts and uh, experiences as we go along, as long as we keep kind of balanced so that we can uh, get to the end okay. Um, Let's see, let's start here. <laughs> um, this was taken <clears throat> in New York uh, on the High Line, uh, which if you're not familiar is a raised uh, uh, park on an old L there that wanders in between buildings a couple of three stories up. And these folks in this hotel, I guess, uh, were three or four stories higher than me up there. Um, <clears throat> I, think that this is in some ways, it's, this is not especially a great photo, but it does bring up some of the issues that you encounter if you're a street photographer, especially in terms of distinguishing between uh, legal uh, issues and ethical issues. So it's perfectly legal to stand in a public space and take a photo through a glass window into somebody's private home. That's, that's okay to do, because you're in a public space. Um, whether it's ethical or not, that's a different question. And most everything I say tonight is going to be about ethics and not the legality of it. I think I have a good understanding of the basic legal issues that are involved, and so maybe we can feel some uh, of those if they come up in the conversation. But really, I'm more concerned with um, trying to figure out what's right to do than I am in knowing my rights uh, as a photographer. So. Um, this is an intrusive photo, and it's really, it's kind of an adolescent photo in a way. It's uh, uh, like, oh, isn't this funny? There's a naughty shot of these people half-dressed who don't know I'm looking through the peephole of my lens at them in their state of undress. <clears throat> Diane Arbus uh, thought that um, uh, all photography was essentially naughty, and that that was a big part of the reason why she engaged it. And so that's not quite the way I work with it. But, um, but this one, I think, um, it's, it's kind of funny, but it um, introduces 
something of uh, the issues that you see as a photographer. Would they have wanted me to take this picture? Probably not. And if I had asked them beforehand, they probably would have said, no, you can't do it. And if I had showed it to them afterwards, they probably would have said, no, you can't publish that or do anything with that because it violates their privacy. But I want to argue that that's too bad. Uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> when we do street photography, I think we lift up some experiences that make people uncomfortable and turn them into something else that redeems them. So we'll see if you agree with me as we go along. Any right, so you're saying that maybe this is not an intrusion since they should have, they probably picked that place because they could open the windows. And, yeah, that, that could well be. Yeah. So why not? So if they've, if they've arranged to have themselves on display, then it, it must be ethical to do it, yes. <laughs> well, I agree with that. And by the way, I wasn't like waiting around for window shades to open to take this. I was walking on the High Line and I noticed people in front of me were all looking up and pointing and laughing at these people. And so that's how I happened to realize that that was going on. Fortunately, I had a zoom lens on my camera. So, well, let's try a different photo. Okay, this one <coughs> is to me a good example of a good street photograph and not one that crosses any boundaries that would bother anybody. There's some issues about it, though. So um, it's, this is taken in New York City in Lincoln, <laughs> Lincoln Center, in the plaza in front of Lincoln Center. And there are issues on display here. For instance, class, maybe race, uh, wealth versus poverty, um, culture versus not culture, I don't know for sure. But there's a distinction that I'm trying to make in the photograph between the person who's having to sweep up that plaza and the people in the poster behind them who are dancing there. And I hope the, the kind of rhyme in their postures and gestures makes that happen well. Um, most of the time when I take photos, I don't know what I've got until afterwards and I'm processing it. But on this one, I was just going, oh God, this is so great. This light has arranged itself and this person has walked into the beam of light. It's, it was, uh, I was really pleased to do it. So this to me is a, one that doesn't violate anything, but it is a street photograph. I don't know if this person uh, having to do the sweep up would have wanted me to take this photo or not, but I don't feel like it violates anything about him as an individual by having put that up there. When you took the photo, were you thinking about the old like 40s and 50s posters of like the happy family in the car with, and then like the poor people were like a lower income class yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, uh, it was happening too fast for me to really think about past historical photos, but I, I kind of feel like I've looked at a lot of that kind of photography, and it probably informed uh, the photo that I was taking then. And always in uh, street photography, real, most always, you're working with a foreground background juxtaposition, putting those together and seeing what sparks come out of that. Yeah, yeah you're raising issues about culture and how different cultures uh, want to interpret uh, the photograph and then ways that they are behaving and acting that are culturally maybe mysterious or hidden to me because I'm part of another culture and I will misinterpret what they're doing because I'm seeing it through the lens of my own own culture and I think that's a very valid uh, issue and there are a couple of things I want to say later about that as well as you bring up the issue of uh, should you ask them first or should you let them know afterwards and there are reasons why that doesn't work, I think. And one is that <clears throat> first, if you ask them, you won't get the same photo. Uh, you, you, then you're posing the photo. It's no longer a candid photo. Um, and to me, that means it's no longer a street photo. It's more of a negotiation and contract with that person. You can, after you've taken the picture, go and show that to them on the screen. But what they see on that screen will probably bear little resemblance to what it's going to look like in the end as a photo. Because I tweak all of these photos. Uh, in Lightroom, and so there's, uh, uh, it, it might look like a, you know, a, a dark area on the screen, but uh, there's, he wouldn't have any way of knowing what that would really look like as the photo, nor would I until the end. And <clears throat> I want to argue that he doesn't, that you don't have to do that as a street photographer, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. It is, it is, it is different in different cultures. Uh, somebody remarked on the Facebook post I'd done about some of these issues that in South Korea, um, it is illegal to take pictures of women on the streets and that you can be fined heavily or even jailed for the attempt because it's seen as a sexual assault uh, to do that. Which is yeah, I, and uh, thanks, and I, I'd, I'd like to think that's, that's the way that's worked there as well. You know, that it's not, uh, I'm not trying to uh, 
be derogatory to that person at all. You know, it's really, it's much more the contrast between the two that I'm, I'm trying to bring up. Is there... It is individual and it is cultural. And uh, I agree that you as an individual have to come up with your own ethical standards for what you think is appropriate and inappropriate. Though I think you mentioned uh, it's important to have respect for the people that you're encountering. In generally in life, I agree with you. Though there are issues here that make me question what respect means for another person in this context. And I, and I hope a little further on to get more into that. Thank you. This picture, uh, again, New York, I, they're kind of clumped here. Uh, New York, uh, she's sitting beside Central Park on that bench there. And I was uh, on the other side of the street and the light had hit her in an interesting way that's maybe not quite uh, as wonderful in this projection of it as it was when I saw it in real life. But I, I literally ran across the street because I wanted to get there before that light shifted that was hitting her on the face. But I had to do it secretly because if she knew that I was gonna run up to her and take this photo, I, she would have been unhappy, I'm sure, about doing that. <clears throat> it seems to me that she's in a very private moment here, just she and the pigeons, and that it was intrusive for me to come up close. And if I'd gotten any closer and she had known I was doing it, I would have intruded on her private reverie or whatever that she was going through there. At least that's what I imagine. Maybe she was thinking about lunch, I don't know. Um, but again, it seems to me like it's okay for me to have taken this photo. I don't feel like it disrespects her, whatever her choice would have been. And I feel instead that rather it, it adds to, if I say humanity, I'm not sure that's the right word for it, but it, it feels to me like we're making a connection because I've gone and taken this slightly a uh, semi-intimate picture of her in a public space. Maybe not. Let me, let me move on a bit, though. Okay, so <clears throat> you have to note, if you're not noting it, the small figure on the bottom right there. <clears throat> and <clears throat> here, I think, we're getting into something of what street photography can do that makes me most excited, which is this playoff between the foreground, the tiny human figure on the bottom right, and the giant advertising figures above <clears throat> lifts it into an almost mythic realm. Let me emphasize, not because I think I'm such a wonderful photographer that I can create myths with my photos, but just rather that putting those two things together there makes that happen. And the giant uh, 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 figures, they're like oligarchical uh, uh, goddesses or something, uh, compared to a person at the bottom who is just looks to me like a normal person. Uh, standing there who is also taking a photo. But it introduces an element that you can't predict and that um, lifts this photo up from a simple documentary image of a woman standing below an advertising thing into some different dimension, into a different realm. Because it makes you have to think about what that scale difference says about our relationship to the culture as a whole and capitalism. Well, and I think if that photo succeeds at all, it's exactly for that reason that it takes a moment to process that big difference in scale and to see what the kind of metaphorical effects of that are. And just uh, having thrown in the word metaphorical, um, I think photographs are largely metaphors rather than descriptors. So to me, this begins to get into that territory some. Let's take a look here. Another New York scene. <clears throat> I'm walking along, crossing the street. Um, and I'm shooting from the hip. My camera is just slung around my waist like this. And I'm, I walk by her and I lift the camera up like, surreptitiously to take the photo um, and get that shot. <coughs> to me, um, uh, yeah, that's, this also is another intrusive photo. She wouldn't have wanted me to take this photo, I think, if she knew I was taking it. And she probably wouldn't like it if she saw it afterwards. But there's something about the New York face that people put on, or any big city, where we think we're hiding the insides by putting on a mask, there's something about doing that that in fact does the opposite and reveals everything about us. Uh, every time we choose a mask, it's actually showing us. As Oscar Wilde once said, give a man a mask and he will tell you the truth. It's that kind of process going on. And in, in the big cities, we're, we all put on those masks so that people won't approach us. But I think it has the opposite effect. I'm not sure about the ethical implications of this particular one, except <coughs> There's the sign up in the upper left that kind of makes a theme for the photo that I believe the guy illustrates at the bottom right. He's in the group of pedestrians, but he's not of them. And he looks different. And he's going the opposite direction. And he just sort of stands out as being, uh, to me, kind of dorky looking and lost. Maybe it's the hat. 
but <clears throat> um, the ethical issue would be, I have cast him in a role in this photograph of the kind of lonely individual in the big city at odds with everybody else. Maybe he wouldn't want me to cast him in that role and would choose some different role if asked. Yeah, that, that's a good question about the photographer's intent. Um, I want to say first that I don't think it matters in terms of the final result. Uh, uh, what, what do they say in uh, literary criticism about the, um, the fallacy, the authorial fallacy? Is that, am I getting that right, Leanne? <laughs> Thanks. Um, that it doesn't matter what the author, what the photographer think about it. What you've got is the final result, and that's what you have to read. And in fact, my intent was neither of the things you mentioned about uh, looking at that and waiting for the next person. I was walking along Times Square area, again with the camera down low, and I was, I was in the kind of blissful state that uh, street photography induces in me, where I feel like my peripheral vision widens out and I'm alert to all the incidents that are going on in it. And the way this guy looked, the lighter coloring of his clothes, his expression on his face, the way the light was hitting him, and that uh, poster up there uh, triggered it. And then I just took the picture without thinking much further about it. And I, I really think intent is tricky in this case too. Street photography in general, you don't have time to work out intent very often. I mean, I guess there are ways that you can do street photography where you can set that up a little more uh, with intention. You can stand at one street corner and intentionally take pictures of people in a certain way, but it's happening so quickly that you have to trust some other more intuitive thing. I, I almost never realize at the instant what I'm doing. All I know is I should take that picture. And so then I do take the picture and then later I throw away 99 of the 100 pictures I took. Uh, but the one that I keep is the one that made me think, yeah, that's what was going on. It was that guy and his relationship to that image up there on the, the poster. Okay, so here's, here's another one. This is inside the Met in New York. <clears throat> and um, I, again, I, I, I wasn't consciously thinking when I took it. All I knew was this little girl and that statue were doing something interesting and moving to me when I saw it, and so I just had to take it. <clears throat> Whenever you have pictures of children, that raises a lot of different issues than it does adults. The idea of consent and respect in this case um, is moot in some ways because children are under the age of consent. They can't give you their consent. But on the other hand, they are terrific subjects for street photography. They are completely unselfconscious. They're doing the things you wish the adults would do. If only an adult person had been bent down on the floor in front of that statue, I would have been on it in a minute. Great, you know. But it's only the little kids who do things like that. <clears throat> um, as I was putting this, this show together, the presentation, I before that was thinking, you know, I rarely take pictures of kids in street photography. But then I started realizing, no, actually, I've got quite a few pictures of kids uh, uh, doing this. And it's for that reason. It's that they're totally unconcerned with you as the photographer. It's like taking a picture of a creature, another creature in the world. Um, you wouldn't think about asking consent of a cat or dog uh, because they can't give you <laughs> consent. And in the same way, kids can't either, at least legally and probably not ethically. Either one. I, I love taking pictures in museums. I love watching the way people uh, comport themselves in front of art. And I have several that I've taken in the Met. And every time I go to New York, which is not often enough, I go take photos in the museums. Let's see. A little hard to see this one, but it's in a flea market in, uh, uh, near Oakland, California. Uh, this, we were visiting my oldest son who lives in Oakland. And so to show us a good time, he took us to the flea market because he understands <laughs> us. <laughs> and, uh, um, th this woman seems to me like um, a goddess of the flea market. She seems to be standing regally and just the way the light is hitting her. And then that mysterious extra arm that's coming out her right-hand side <laughs> seems to lift her into some uh, other dimension, <laughs> um, an Indian uh, goddess or something like Shiva with the many arms. Um, again, th this one doesn't seem to me to cross any ethical boundaries, though I suspect she would not have wanted me to take the picture, just as most people don't want you to when you, you're taking a, a surreptitious picture of them. And this as well, um, uh, also in the flea market. The change in scale between the man and the woman there makes this, for me, a fairly surreal image. And I, I'm all about disrupting traditional uh, gender roles, uh, big, little, great. Let's all just take that in new directions, so I'm fine. Um, but it's so pronounced in this that it took me a moment to realize what I was even taking a picture of when I took it. And again, it was an instantaneous, like, wow. Um, 
but it makes it, it makes it surreal and unusual. And I just look at this and it's, it's distressing in some ways because it plays against the gender stereotypes because it, uh, that scale just throws you off and makes you think it's science fiction or something. Thanks. And, and that relationship between the dad and the kid was an intriguing aspect of that to me. And they've got the same kind of haircut and they're connected and that line coming down there with the arm and um, it just adds to the mystery of it somehow to me. It's like he's the little me of, of that guy who's a little me compared to the, the bigger woman. Um, this is a street photograph in the sense that it's sort of in the street. Uh, it was one of the protest uh, rallies around uh, uh, Representative Heiss's uh, representatives meetings and this guy was talking to the crowd and urging them stay strong we're only going to get better if you uh, keep the battle going. Um, uh, there's such a nice contrast between him and the people there that it is, remains to me a powerful image to look at. Though I'm not quite so sure it doesn't cross the line from street photography to photojournalism. And I think that's an important distinction to keep in mind as we do street photography. That when you're doing photojournalism, you are documenting something and you are trying to get that right. You want to be able to show clearly what is happening there, the people, their relationships. That's your responsibility as a photojournalist to make that clear and not to make lies about it. Um, but on the other hand, it, it still has a foot in the street photography camp just because you don't know much about what's going on there. And it's, it's about this relationship between the, the haranguer of the crowd and that crowd as much as it is about that specific event that was going on. Yeah, and uh, you're asking about uh, how the context would change if you were captioning it, and <clears throat> that's very true. And that relationship between images and words, uh, it continues to interest me, and I, it's profound, and I, yeah, I haven't quite figured out how best to deal with it. <coughs> yeah. um, I will briefly mention that um, on Facebook for a while, I, I post too many things on Facebook, okay. Um, I would put up images and then put up a, an extended caption about what was going on in that image as though the image was an illustration of what I had written when in fact they had nothing to do with each other. But I, I think I was confusing people sometimes who thought that it was real what I was saying and so I stopped doing that for a bit. Okay, this is uh, to me a street photograph um, and a happy one. <laughs> and this is in London, Trafalgar Square. They're sitting on the lion and I, I just feel like uh, the obvious love they have for each other and their joy at this moment uh, is made explicit by the fact that they're sitting on this massive lion that's lifted them up into the sky. So wonderful is their affection for each other. And I, I think that's another thing that, that street photography can do. It doesn't have to be all about um, um, revealing the underlying contradictory subtext of uh, whatever the situation is. It can celebrate as well. And this is what was happening at the other end of that lion. Uh, the little kid having a good time with it. So, I like to show this one because also London, um, I'm sitting on the ground by this lake there it's in the park. I'm exhausted, my feet hurt, I have plantar fasciitis, and um, I'm, every step is painful, and so I finally, I'm just sitting down on the ground, I can't do this anymore. Um, and these people wander by. And to me, the image is something about the wonder of childhood and father-son relations. And it's like the kid is having a great time, he's lifted up there, and then miraculously this bird flies into the image as they're doing it. It just seems to be, uh, I couldn't have planned it any better. Thank you, bird, for flying into there and, and making it look that great. But I have to tell you that the reality is they were kind of having a fight. And as they walked by, the dad was going, I told you, don't put your hands over my eyes anymore. I'm really getting irritated here. <laughs> and so the little kid is gleeful because he's, He's poking his hands in dad's eyes, you know, and it's just, so when we talk about the reality of what you're photographed versus an intent versus what you get when you're doing street photography, I think this illustrates that the reality of it has nothing to do with what we get, which distinguishes it again from photojournalism, where you want those things to have some relation. Also London, uh, uh, another hip shot and walking around dun, 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 and this woman's holding, I imagine her husband's head and, her lap, I thought it was a warm, wonderful scene. Um, who doesn't like to lie in somebody's lap, you know, with your head? <laughs> um, and I took it, and right after I took it, the woman holding this man's head saw me that I had taken it, but she just smiled at me. She, it was like, I, I gave her the thumbs up sign, and she gave me a big smile, and she started telling her husband, or whoever it is, that what I had just done, and it was, it was just heartwarming all around <laughs> to do that. Um, 
Oh, yes. And in fact, in London, uh, where they have raised surveillance, they have weaponized surveillance. And uh, um, I was taking photos, um, and I think it was also in Trafalgar Square. There was a big crowd. There was a kind of political protest of some kind going on. I didn't really understand. I was taking a picture of the museum building in the background, crowd in the front. And uh, after three or four shots, there was a guy in a dark suit who got a scowl on his face and walked over to me and said, you need to erase those right now. Uh, I'm going, what? Why? And he says, for security reasons. He was apparently a policeman monitoring the crowd or something along those lines, and he insisted that I do it. Because I'm a, a, a wuss and because I was in a foreign country, I did erase the ones then. And because they were stupid photos anyway. So. Um, but yeah, I, I have had that happen. Not to do that. Again, the instantaneous nature of street photography means you can't plan it and you can't get permission beforehand. There's no way that that could work. Um, this one, again, brings up interesting issues about children and photographs and street photography. I think it's a touching photograph. Um, I was so happy those kids had aligned themselves in that kind of arc going up the hay bale uh, down. Um, I couldn't have planned it, and if I'd tried to, I wouldn't have known how to ask them to do something like that. <clears throat> I didn't ask their parents, who may or may not have been very unhappy with my having taken this picture. <clears throat> and I did put it up on uh, Facebook. but. When I put it up, I also said, um, if anybody knows the parents of these children and they would like a copy of this photo, please get in touch. N nobody ever did, so maybe nobody knew them or whatever. This was here in Athens. Uh, um, uh, San Francisco um, at the Pride Parade, and um, I really almost like the way the tones work in this more than anything else, but just the woman's expression was so terrific and kind of tough that um, I was moved to take it. So, uh, Wild Rumpus, uh, several years ago, <clears throat> it seems to me, again, an example of you can take a literal, clear shot of something going on, but it, it will lift itself up into a metaphorical world almost no matter what you do. What, what's going on there? What's the relationship of that kid to the woman with the mask? And what information is she sharing with him? What's that gesture with her hand to her lips supposed to uh, indicate? And the little kid, is he just like a budding psychopath? Or uh, is, is he just a normal, happy little kid uh, trying to kill people, as they do? Um, I don't know. But to me, this is a very mysterious image. And uh, I couldn't have planned it. Same, same here. Uh, these people look to me like they're dreaming themselves into an archetypal world. And just their eyes are closed. They're just walking. Uh, and it makes me think, yeah, that's, this is what our lives are really like. We're all the time walking around dreaming uh, about some reality when in fact it's a, a fantasy. It's a, we're, we're hallucinating. Um, so what's going on here? It's a funeral, uh, a burial, that is. Um, what's that guy doing there? Is he putting something in the grave? Or is he taking something out of the grave? Whose grave is that? <laughs> is he falling into the grave? Is something pulling him down into the grave? I mean, the reality is he was probably uh, putting an urn of ashes in that hole. But to me, looking at this, it makes it look like there's something extremely mysterious going on. It's about life and death more than it is about this guy arranging the urn in that hole in the ground. Yeah. It's like a, that poem about, uh, about suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. There's always somebody just hanging out in the corner uh, while somebody else has fallen from the sky. You know? yeah. And that uh, enigmatic nature of this image, that's really what I'm after, man. It's just if I can look at some, make, take a photo that then I look at it and feel like it's important, but I don't understand it, I feel like I've arrived. With <laughs> um, my wife does dog sports, and so uh, I get dragged to dog shows fairly often. And so I have a fair amount of people and their dogs photos. And boy, if you want to do some fun photos, go to a dog show, because the relationship between people and their dogs is intense and varied and wonderful. So, um, to me, this is about human and animal connections and resonance. And I think they look just alike, uh, the man and his dog. <laughs> And I saw that a lot, actually, at the dog shows. The people and their dogs, they, they would bear a strong resemblance to each other. And I don't know what to say. But, and one more. Um, I'm just going to let this one pass. But, um, I like to take pictures of other people taking pictures of other people. It's just it's a lot of fun. And so here we are on top of Chimney Rock. And these folks, of course, they're taking a picture of their kid or a kid they know or something. And all around are the splendid wonders of nature. But what we look at is the person's face that's right there. And this one is another. This was in Atlanta uh, at the, 
the Olympic Park, the, the water all shoots up from the ground. Um, and this is one of the photos that I've taken where I got ran away by the police uh, after taking it. I was walking around, there were a hundred kids in this thing and just all having a great time jumping up and down in the water. And so I was circling around trying to get as many good shots as I could. And then uh, it must have bothered one of the parents who were standing around who called the security guy over and told me that I needed to leave. And I remember he said, you can go take some pictures over there somewhere. And I was like, okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, but though this raises issues about the kids again, um, to me, this is all about something else. It's, to me, this looks like a vision of hell, actually, like a Bashian uh, vision of what it's like in hell. Those people's faces here laughing, the kid in the front and the kid a little further back with the white t-shirt on, they look to me like all the kids who gave me a lot of crap when I was in uh, junior high, you know? And it's just like, it, it just, it, uh, to me, this is a scene of horror. And it's irrelevant that they're little kids doing it. If there have been people, adults doing it, same thing. Okay, so this is the kind of stuff that street photography means to me. It's like they're fables or hallucinations or dreams or fantasies, visions. It's not about capturing what that individual person was actually doing. <clears throat> it li if a successful one lifts it up into one of these realms, into metaphor and poetry. Well, well let me ask this. Um, if street photography is so wonderful and it does all these things and it lifts us up into these metaphorical realms of magic and poetry and myth and uh, everything like that, then, um, <clears throat> oh, first let me say this, sorry. Yeah. Um, to me, it doesn't matter at all who the actual person is in the photos I'm taking. They have nothing to do with the realm I'm trying to get to with the street photography. And I wanna, I wanna make beginning the argument of um, <clears throat> ethical concerns about taking another person's image are irrelevant to this project. It just doesn't matter because that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get it into this other realm and I'm not trying to capture that. It could have been a different person entirely in every one of those photos and it might have been the same effect in that photo. It just doesn't matter. That's all just seems irrelevant to the enterprise. So what's the ethical issue then? What's the problem for somebody like me doing that? Well, the problem is that not everyone agrees with that idea. And they feel like you're taking something from them when you take their image. And maybe you all agree with that to do. The power of representational imagery that photography can do is enormous. You can't just ignore it because the, <clears throat> that's what we rely on with photographs is to give us this true picture of what really happened visually. But that tension between <clears throat> its power of representation and its ability to take us into a realm beyond representation, that's where I live and that's where I work as a street photographer and that's the zone where ethical issues kind of bubble along. Yes, we've already done that. Let me just quickly image, consent, context, and art. Those are the lenses, haha, through which I wanna uh, kind of briefly lead us. Um, an image, <clears throat> do you own your image? <clears throat> okay, the, you're outside, the sunlight is from our exploding star, it's traveled 93 million miles, it passes through the atmosphere, it comes down, it bounces off the face of somebody standing in the street. I stand there and hold up the camera and it, the light bounces into the camera receiver. Um, where is the person's image in that process? It's like it's a mystical idea that there's some representational image that's real that I've taken from that person. In reality, there's this big, huge interstellar process going on, and that image is just something we make up. Maybe, maybe you agree or you don't. Um, do you own your shadow? I, I think probably most people would say, well, no. Well, I think there's no difference between saying you own your shadow and saying that you own your image from a photograph. And in that sense, it's none of my subject's business what kind of photos I take of them. It's nothing to do with them at all. It's all about light and other things going on. I, I agree. It's like the, the, the person, in a way, is secondary to the composition, the tones, and the way that all comes across. Thank you. Yes. Um, so let's, let's take a look at that for a minute. Um, <laughs> here's, talking about images and what they have to do with reality, here's some pictures of me taken over some years. Um, this one, this one. As you can see, I've picked out the most handsome looking photos that I could find of me. That's me, you know. That's me. That was me in an unfortunate time of my life. Oh. 
that's me, younger, that's me, younger, that's me, that's me. Even that is me at a different time <laughs> in my life. <laughs> I was thinner then. Um. So when you take a picture, what are you taking? As far as I can tell, you're not taking anything away from somebody. So when you say some, when you might object, well, when you take a picture and somebody doesn't know it, it's just like you steal money from their bank and they don't find out. So are those ethically the same? Well, they're not really because you're not taking anything when you take the picture. I'm making a picture instead of taking a picture. Yes, I agree. Um, uh, consent, we've already talked about that to a certain extent. Um, in this museum, this, I was really taking a picture of a human figure compared to that uh, big uh, sculpture statue thing in the back. Just as I was about to take snap the shutter, she turned and saw me and scowled at me for doing it. And I, at that point, I went ahead and took it, but she looked very unhappy. She would not have given me her consent. And my argument through most of this is, their consent doesn't matter in street photography. Um, same here, uh, New York, uh, hand uh, around the waist, um, I'm walking round and round one of the little parks in New York City, uh, taking pictures of people sitting on the park benches, and they were one that I got. They wouldn't have wanted me to take this picture. They're clearly in some intimate moment of emotional difficulty. But on the other hand, I think it's kind of a cool picture, and so uh, I took it. So you asked me, David, earlier, do I take ones that sometimes I think I shouldn't have taken, or that having taken, I wouldn't show? This is one that I've never shown anywhere, really. It, paints this guy in a very unhappy light. He's asleep in the daytime on the bench. If you were looking, if you could see a close-up enlargement, his nose is uh, varicose veins all over his nose. It looks like maybe he drinks a lot or something. There's a wristband that looks like he just got out of the hospital on one arm. Uh, he doesn't look like he's in a happy spot in his life. Um, and I took the picture and I haven't thrown it away. But I don't think I would try to publish this picture because it just makes him look unhappy and bad, you know? So. Uh, and so there is an ethical line that I guess I do respect in some sense there. Um, same here. <clears throat> is it okay sometimes to take pictures of beggars in the street? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I guess it depends a lot on the way it's uh, done and on the context in which you promote it. And we're kind of getting close to the end of the time, so I'm going to have to kind of zip a bit on this part. Um, but this next one, uh, did I tell you that there would be some nudity in this presentation? Anyway, there will be. So let's see. Uh, this fellow right here was at um, a parade and he was just walking around naked <coughs> as part of the parade and he had a camera with him. And so I took this picture. He probably wouldn't want me to publish it and I don't know that I have. I might have put it on Facebook. But <coughs> should I not have taken that photo? How could, a, how could you have resisted taking that photo when the only nude person beside the parade to take that? It's like... Um, and again, as I mentioned ago, if they don't know you took the picture and never will know, does that change the ethical question or not? I don't know. A um, couple more. Uh, it looks to me like this woman uh, at another parade in Oglethorpe is just about to twist that little baby's head off or something. It just looks demented and evil uh, to me. <laughs> she probably wasn't evil and demented, you know, but... Um, I still, I took the picture anyway, because it just seemed powerful to me. And uh, what about people at risk? We've mentioned before, kids, you know, or somebody brought up an online thing about, um, they worked with um, uh, battered women and children who were at risk, and uh, they were in a battered women's center, and she was saying, you know, those people at that center need not to be identified online because it puts them at greater risk for harm. That's true, and I don't have any answer to that question, except how am I gonna know that on the street when I'm passing through uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people? It's impossible to know that. And I don't think a photo I've taken has ever resulted in that kind of harm, and I hope not, but it would definitely make me think harder about some of these issues if I learned that that was the case to do. Um, context, we're gonna have to skip a good bit here. Um, you're always taking things in some kind of context. You can't run out of cultural context. So you've always got to take that into account. And uh, what you're gonna do with it is gonna change the ethical calculation. Um, <clears throat> to me, if I'm making what I think of as an art photo and I put it on display in an art gallery, that's almost okay almost all the time because you can do a lot in that context. But if I'm putting it in social media in some context that disadvantages that person, not so much. 
making money for it, that's one of the key issues about legality uh, and permission and consent of the person. Um, if you are uh, selling that image for advertising or other things, then it becomes a legal issue. And uh, is, are all these issues gonna matter? Are they male or female harm to them? Do you put children at risk? Those are the questions that I don't have the good answers for. As I think the, the way that I do it, it's okay. <laughs> but I can't swear that if everybody does it, it's gonna be okay. Um, in art, <clears throat> what if it's a really good photograph? What if it was really unethical for you to take that picture? What if you crossed every line that you can think of that to you personally or it's ethically bad, but you got out of it this magnificent photo that you think is absolutely wonderful? Does that change the ethical calculation at all? I don't know, but let me ask this. What if you did that same thing and you didn't take a picture of that person, but you wrote a story about that person? Would that be the same ethical calculation? What if you made a drawing of that person or a painting? Or what if you, what if, if you uh, created a melody expressing your feelings about that person? Uh, or as I said online, uh, if you did an interpretive dance about that person's face, would there be an ethical issue there? Probably not. But what I'm left with that finally here is a paradox, I think, which is that <coughs> photography objectifies visually people, turns them into visual objects. But on the other hand, it offers the opportunity to lift them into the human family in a way that perhaps that individual wasn't in other expressions before. I don't know how to resolve this, but that conflict is one of the things that kind of keeps me interested in going with it. Thank you so much for, we're about we're running out of time. I really appreciate it.